okay? They, they don't follow me. We follow it, okay? So <laughs> turn to page number two. Page number two. Glory to his name. Let's all stand. That's right. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. We, uh, Erin is having surgery tomorrow. So she's been not able to do it. And Ms. Ruth has willingly said she would, and she's sick today. So I don't know how to play the piano, so we're going to do it this way. So, but uh, now, now you see why I said it goes fast. It does go fast. Turn to page number 66. Sing at Calvary. Page number 66. I'd like to uh, request prayer for. Number one is do pray for my wife. She is going for surgery tomorrow morning. Her surgery is scheduled for 10.30. Uh, it's just a uh, day surgery, and she's only supposed to be in surgery for 20, 30 minutes. Recovery for an hour, about an hour, then we're headed back home. So uh, do be in prayer for her. She's kind of concerned about it as well as I am. And uh, she doesn't do well with anesthesia or, uh, or pain uh, medicine, so she gets really nauseated. So be in prayer for her if you would. Uh, also be in prayer for Brother Jimmy Banks, who's coming to preach uh, our revival this week. 
Uh, he will be leaving uh, this afternoon from uh, Columbus, Mississippi, and driving to meet us. He should be here around midnight tonight or thereabouts. And uh, so um, uh, pray for him and his travels. Also, we pray for the revival that we will be having uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, at 7 p.m., and then he'll be preaching our chapel if you're off during the daytime. He'll be preaching our school chapel at, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 10 a.m., and then a youth rally Friday night, and then he will be uh, preaching Sunday morning and Sunday night next week. So uh, be sure to be here and, uh, and, and support him. He's an awesome preacher. Uh, their church is, uh, uh, last year when he came, their church had uh, uh, over um, a year and a half of someone saved every week at almost every service, uh, and uh, that's almost unheard of in our day and time. Uh, but uh, uh, God's been blessing his, his ministry tremendously. Not only is he a, a pastor, and pastor church of three to 400 people. He also is a, a captain on the sheriff's department in Columbus. And so uh, as well what's going on with, uh, with the sheriff's office, the uh, police officers nowadays, you know, also be in prayer for him on that. And then also be in prayer for me, if you would. I'm on my second round of bronchitis. Just don't tell my wife. <laughs> uh, she told me yesterday, she said, don't you think you need to go to urgent care? And I'm going, ah, no, I'm okay. It's just all up in my head. This morning I'm getting ready and I'm going, uh, so, uh, just don't tell her that, okay? Uh, but if you would help me, usually when I start getting bronchitis on a regular basis, it's usually due to stress, and I don't know why I would have any stress at all in my life right now. Uh, but anyway, if you would just be in prayer for us, let's bow to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness, your mercies, and your grace for us. Uh, Father, I just pray this morning, Lord, that you would uh, uh, be with those requests that we have already. Lord, my wife, Lord, she goes to surgery. Uh, Lord, that uh, you would uh, watch over her, protect her, help her, Lord, through the anesthesia and the pain meds that they give her, uh, Lord, because it usually nauseates her, Lord, I pray that uh, also, Lord, that you would uh, just uh, be with Brother Banks as he, uh, their anniversary services today, uh, Lord, I pray that you'd uh, bless the services, Lord, with an abundance of souls that are saved and lives changed. Father, we also pray today for uh, those who are unable to be here, we pray for uh, Brother Claude and Ms. Helen, Lord, as they recover from surgery. I also pray, thank you, Lord, that uh, Brother Daryl's able to be here today after getting snake bit. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, working on his uh, foot leg, Lord, to uh, heal that. And then, Heavenly Father, we pray for others that may be out sick today. Miss Ruth is out sick. Uh, Lord, we just pray for her, Lord, that you'd be with her and uh, raise her up as quickly as possible. And, Father, we just ask your blessing on the service today. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday a.m. services of Garden Grove Baptist Church. If you'll allow me, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to Psalm 100. Short little psalm here. It's just five um, verses long. It gives uh, three what to do's and then it gives the, the why after. It's a great psalm. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And then it tells you why. It always answers the why question. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. That's the God we're here to worship this morning, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that y'all chose to be here with us today to do so. If you're a visitor, if you uh, did not get one of these cards here in the lobby from some of our greeters, what we'd ask you to do, if you look in the seat in front of you, if you wouldn't mind filling one out for us and putting it in the offering plate as it comes by, we'd love to have a record of your visit with us here today. Moving to our announcements, we have something special coming up. We have our fall revival as the pastor was speaking with between October 5th and 11th with Brother, Brother Jimmy Banks from Life Baptist Church in Columbus, Mississippi. Tremendous preacher. You know, and he, he blessed our church mightily last year when he was here, and I'm sure he will do so again. And for the history buffs among us, this guy is like the, the fourth great grand descendant of Robert E. Lee. <laughs> no kidding. Which, you know, if you're an egg-headed history buff like a lot of people we know, that's really cool. Uh, but anyway, uh, Monday he, through Wednesday, he will be preaching the 7 p.m. service. And then at Lighthouse Baptist Academy, he's going to be talking to our youth on, on Tuesday through Thursday at 10 a.m. And then at Friday, we have a youth rally that he's going to sponsor at 7 p.m. It's going to be over at Rodney. We'll be here or... or be here in the in the uh, auditorium, and then Brother Banks is, Banks is going to be preaching both services on Sunday, October the 11th. 
Uh, speaking of Lighthouse Baptist Academy, our fundraiser, our candy fundraiser, starts Tuesday. This is some really good chocolate candy that y'all uh, wouldn't mind purchasing. Our purchasing to sell would really go a long ways to helping our school out. This goes directly to the operating fund. Uh, Lighthouse Baptist Academy works really hard at keeping a low price point because we want to make it affordable and accessible to as many people as possible. Because, you know, what's the alternative? You know, you've got a public school system that basically tells kids you are nothing, came from nothing and you're going to nothing. And here you're going to get a quality, good education. And at the same time, you're going to get educated that you're a child of the king. And that makes all the difference in the world. Again, thank you for being here today. If you're home folk, it's always good to see you. If you're a visitor, as always, we hope you come as a visitor, but we hope that you leave as a friend. Thank you. I hope everyone gets a blessing. It's a good chocolate. World's finest chocolate. I tell you what. And it, it's the almonds. That, yeah. That's their best seller. And so uh, we've ordered enough. So, and we can always order more. So we're, we're excited about it. So, and you'll probably hit up a few times. You got, if you get to church, there'll be young people that have it, and uh, it's going to the school. That's not going to their pocket. It's going to the school. But we're excited. Oh, well, clear. Turn to page number 29. We're going to ask you to stand as the men come forward to see the offering on the last chorus. Page number 29 at the cross. remember that moment when you turn on the mic when you if you can remember that moment when you met the cross say amen it, my phone locked on me sorry the uh, book of first Timothy chapter 4 verse 15 the Bible says meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all one thing that uh, most people don't understand is the reason we are supposed to follow the Bible is not only for our own blessing, but so that other people can see Christ in us. While we are supposed to tell people about Jesus Christ, the Great Commission is given five times in the first five books of the New Testament. Throughout the whole Bible, we're instructed to show Christ, to live Christ. Because if all you have is your words, they're meaningless. But when you're showing Christ through who you are, that's what people see different. That's when people can say, you know what, I don't know what's different about that person, but they have something that I want. And that's how God is glorified. When people can see that. And one of the ways we do that, as weird as it seems, is through our tithes and offerings. 
this uh, this body of believers. One of our goals is to support each other and encourage each other and show each other uh, how to better grow and show Christ. That's the reason we come to to morning services is so we can get a word from the man of God that will encourage us and show us better ways to follow Christ Jesus, what the Bible says. Now we have to pay for the air conditioning. Praise God, we have air conditioning. I know it's a beautiful day, but I'm still thankful for air conditioning. And we have lights, which is good because a lot of us can't see if you don't have them, right? And, uh, you know, we, we have to pay for all the taxes and, and the building and all that. And that's what your tithe goes to. And then we have offerings, which is what you give above that, above that 10%, which that goes to our all of our ways we have to reach out to the community. All the things we have, like our tracks we have that you can give out, our RU program, our Sunday school classes, our jail ministry, our Swan Manor ministry. All the different things that we have where we go out into the world to do the Great Commission have to be paid for. And uh, that money, we're, we're a hospital where the, the nurses and the staff are the ones who put the bill. That's what we are. So uh, as we receive the offering this morning, remember that this isn't uh, a time to, to joke and laugh and, and cut up. This is a time for remembering that God has blessed your finances and to glorify God through your finances by following his uh, will and giving your 10%, your tithe, and then what he calls you to give above that, which is your offering. And uh, as we receive the offering, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Roy to use some prayer. Dear Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for your many blessings in our lives, Lord. And we just pray today right now, Lord, that you help us to remember how good you are to us, Lord, and help us to try to be more good for you and for those about us, Lord. Remind us that we are that light unto the world, Lord, that we need to be showing your light unto the world, Lord, and help us to support the church and its ministries, Lord. But, Lord, we're getting ready to get into the preaching, Lord. I just pray that you join us today. Bring down the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Speak to us through your man of God, Brother Jim, Lord, and give us what we need to hear, Lord. And we, We just need to hear from you today, Lord. Encourage us to be stronger and teach us how to serve you better, Lord. In a world that's getting darker and darker, Lord, we need your light more and more. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to show your light to the world. Lord, we love you, and we just pray you bless this offering to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Bible started the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 3, Ezekiel, chapter number 3. While you're turning there, I will apologize for my voice if it sounds scratchy and all that, it, it, because it is. I'm working on learning Spanish, and I have a Rosetta Stone uh, that I'm using, and uh, I was practicing. Uh, some of it you have to just choose different uh, phrases and put them with pictures and things like that on my iPad. I do that, and uh, yesterday I was trying to do the speaking parts and it kept giving me errors. <laughs> I'm, going, well, I'm saying it. And uh, so anyway, it kept giving me errors because I guess it wasn't understanding uh, my Spanish. What I was supposed to, Usually I usually get hundreds all the way through it, you know. And <clears throat> uh, Yesterday it was just giving me a fit. So uh, if you don't understand me, I apologize. I do have a cough drop. If, I, if you see me put it in my mouth, um, You'll know that uh, I'm trying to keep from coughing through the whole thing uh, because there will be a point in time that I could start coughing. I, I've, this, I've been doing this for years, so I absolutely understand that. Uh, I heard one preacher say one time that uh, he tried to limit his messages and keep them from going for you know forever, and so he always took a mint and he put it in his mouth just as he stood up to preach, and when that mint was gone, that was time to start the invitation and, and go on from there. One day he got confused and put a button in his mouth and uh, two hours later, he was done. Well, this is not this is not a button. I'll promise you. So, if you see me put it in my mouth, we're not here for three hours. <laughs> I don't think I've, I I have that much energy to be here for three hours. I'm more, my legs are already going like this. Uh, that's why I did not stand up at the last song and and offering. I apologize for that. I normally do. That's why I wasn't singing. I normally sing. Uh, Brother Steve usually hears me singing. He's usually looking over there like, would you at least sing the right words? <laughs> you know. So. Uh, I'm sure he's probably wishing I would just sing the right keys, too. I sing like I'm in prison, behind bars and can't find the key. So, anyway, Ezekiel chapter number 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 15. I'm bringing a message entitled this morning, The Watchman, uh, The Watchman. Ezekiel chapter number 3, verse number 15, says, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv, and that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them for seven days. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, 
son of man. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, he doth not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned also thou hast delivered thy soul. I want to call your attention back to uh, verse number 17, and I want to uh, look at that phrase, I have made thee a watchman. I have made thee a watchman. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your blessings again. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Lord, it's uh, important, Lord, that we read the word of God, that we study the word of God, that we apply uh, the Word of God to our lives every day. And Father, I just pray this morning, Lord, that you would uh, use this portion of Scripture that we've chosen today, I believe, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, that we might, Lord, uh, uh, learn a lesson today that would be important to us. Lord, uh, it seemingly is a, a message towards those who are saved, but Lord, there's a message in here to also for those who are unsaved, Lord, to take warning. Father, we just ask your blessings again. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let me loosen up. I'm already getting here now. You will see this is a mint, not a bow. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We've been studying the book of Ezekiel, and I believe that the that the church should study the Bible, the Word of God. And I believe that the Bible should be preached in such a way that we don't just pick and choose our different topics and different texts. Because what happens is when the preacher pulls a certain text out of a scripture. Uh, he kind of tends to preach what we call hobby horses, uh, the things that appeal to him, things that he likes. Now, if it were personal, personal to me, if I were going to do that, I would preach almost solely on uh, on uh, the second coming of Christ. I'd preach on prophecy a lot uh, because that's something that appeals to me, not because I'm uh, anticipating a day or an hour, but uh, I, I just can see in the Word of God things that are being fulfilled in our day and time that uh, the prophets of old wrote about, and uh, because they wrote about it, and now we're seeing it come to pass, it's, it's, it's just exciting to see uh, what's going on. And so I'd probably preach a lot on prophecy. I'd probably preach a lot on salvation. Uh, and there's a few other little topics that I'd probably pull out and, and preach on. Uh, my favorite books of the Bible, of course, are Daniel. I could preach on Daniel just about every, uh, every service and not uh, make a, uh, have a problem with that. Or I could preach on the book of Galatians or the book of Ephesians or uh, the book of Philippians. Uh, those are some of my favorite books as well as the Psalms, and I, I could do that, but what I, what I feel like the Lord wants preachers to do, pastors to do, uh, that are preaching to con congregations is what we call expository preaching, and we take a book and we study through the book and give us the, uh, the consensus of what God is saying to the people, uh, not only when we're, we're dealing with the Old Testament, we have to understand the Old Testament was written so that we may not make the same mistakes that they made in the Old Testament. Okay. In fact, Paul put it this way, that the Word of God is an, an example to us, but it's also an ensample to us that we would not uh, uh, follow the paths of, the, of those before us. And, of course, that's always been the warning of the ch for the children of Israel, that they, the prophets would preach to their fathers, their prophet, the, uh, the fathers uh, uh, killed the prophets and uh, uh, tortured them and put them in prison and all these things. And, of course, Jesus made mention of that and, and almost got stoned. <coughs> well, they were fixing to stone him, but he left. <clears throat> so, it's important to understand the Word of God in its context. I will say that the Word of God from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 is cohesive. In other words, it, it fits together like a glove. And once you put it together, and once you, you study it in its context and under, understand it in its context, you'll understand that God's, that God's perfect plan has been revealed to us uh, through His Word. And this is exactly what's transpiring here in the book of Ezekiel. As we study the book of Ezekiel, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we studied about the 
about the commissioning of Ezekiel to, by God, to go out and preach to the whole house of Israel. Now, interestingly enough, Ezekiel, uh, they were already in captivity because uh, God had prophesied through the prophet Jeremiah uh, before Nebuchadnezzar came in and took the children of Israel into captivity and destroyed the city uh, that uh, this, this would take place and be a period of 70 years. And so we see Ezekiel was contemporary or he was living at the same time. He heard the messages of Jeremiah as well as uh, uh, as Daniel had heard those messages, and both of them wrote, uh, according to the Word of God and under inspiration of the Word of God, uh, the prophecies that we have today. And many of those in Daniel and Ezekiel are repeated in the New Testament. So we see that Jesus uh, and, the Old, and the New Testament prophets, uh, men of God, brought it into the New Testament so we could kind of have a, uh, a, an understanding that these things happened back then, but then they're going to happen here also. And so it's very important to understand that. Well, God had commissioned... Ezekiel to uh, to preach or to give a message to the whole house of Israel. Now they were already in captivity; uh, they were in Babylon, as we said a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he settled by the uh, by the river Kibar, which is a, a canal that connects the Tigris River and the uh, Euphrates River, which are two important rivers, uh, especially in prophecy. And uh, there's a little canal that runs between the two of them. And he settled there in an area called Tel Aviv, not Tel Aviv, but Tel Aviv. Okay, there's a difference. One is in Jerusalem uh, and Israel, and one of them is in uh, uh, Babylon. So <clears throat> two different locations here. While he's commissioning him, he tells him, look, now, I'm going to give you a message, and the people aren't going aren't, aren't to like the message. Just telling you this up front. <laughs> I'm going to give you a message, Ezekiel, and this message that I'm going to give you, the people aren't going to appreciate. They're not going to like the message that you're going to give them but I want your head to be as an adamant stone. What does it mean, an adamant stone? I want you to be hard-headed, kind of like our kids are when we're trying to tell them something, or like we are when we don't want to do something. Okay? He said, I want your head to be like an adamant stone. I want you to be stubborn. I don't want you to back down. I don't want you to compromise. I don't want you to give up. I'm with you. And that's important not only in his day and time, but it's important in our day and time, and we'll talk about that in, in a few moments. But Ezekiel was to have a head like stone. He preached the message of God, and as he preached the message of God, he was to give that message according to the, what God said. He wasn't to change the message. Let me repeat that for Brother Doug, since he's the only one that got that, evidently. He wasn't to change the message. See, a lot of times what we want to do is we want to, well, here's the message, but well, that's kind of harsh. And so what we want to do is we want to make it a little more palatable, a little more acceptable to the crowd. And God says, no, I don't want you to do that because the warnings are there for a purpose. Now, the children of Israel hardened their hearts and they chose to harden their hearts. They chose to disobey God's word. And that's why they're in captivity as it is. And so we need to understand this. Now, in the commissioning, that God gave them, gave him. He says, now, what I want you to do is I want you to be a watchman. A watchman. Now, the principle of the watchman goes throughout the Bible. Uh, when you have uh, uh, a walled city, which in those days and times was very important to have walled cities because people came in to conquer you. And Jerusalem had a walled city. And on those walls, uh, uh, around those walls, they had watchmen that were stationed in, in areas to protect the city from someone who would come at them at night. In other words, these men that stood as a watchman were sitting up there on those walls. Uh, they, there were three watches during the night. started about uh, the time that the sun started going down uh, until the sun came up the next morning. And there were three different watches that were given during that period of time so that uh, the one person would not have to stand up there <coughs> Excuse me, and and stay all uh, awake all night. Years ago, I worked as a security guard uh, for out at uh, uh, out at what was then Golf Chevron now, and uh, uh, you know I did fine during the daytime. I did fine on evenings, but you put me on that graveyard shift, and there's nothing going on. You had to walk around the plant. And you then and one day they put me up in one of those towers, away from everybody. And there's glass all the way on four sides. And I'm sitting out there, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm looking out there. 
And I'm trying to see anything, activity, anything like that, and I'm going. And just, you know, I, I, could, I could keep my eyes open. And I'll, I'll, I'll confess to you, I put my chair over that trap door <laughs> so that if somebody came up and caught me sleeping, I wouldn't get fired. <laughs> because I just could not keep my eyes open. <laughs> it's too late to get fired for it because that's a long time ago. <clears throat> but I'll be honest with you, that's hard to do. From midnight to 8 in the morning. So they had these three watches, so they, 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 they watched, and these guys had to stand there, and if they saw something, then they had to blow a trumpet. They had to warn the people that there was danger coming. Now, they were trained uh, to look out in the night to see different shadows and to see different changes in the, uh, in, the, in the scheme of things to see that there were people coming or there was danger coming to warn the people. That's exactly what God's talking about here. God said, Ezekiel, I want you to be a watchman. He's in Babylon. He's in captivity. He has the freedom to, to roam about. He has the freedom to set up his own house. He has the freedom uh, to have a wife and a family. He has the freedom to do whatever he wants to uh, in that captivity. And what God has called him to do is to be a watchman, to be someone who is going to warn the people of impending judgment. In fact, that is exactly uh, what is being done here. <coughs> Excuse me. From chapter 4 to chapter 24, God warns the children of Israel about impending judgment judgment upon them things that are going to happen if you if you continue to do this these are the judgments that you're going to inherit because of your wickedness and because of your sin and because of following uh, your own way and doing your own thing and not listening to the principles of God your father and so he the, the, his warning from chapter 4 to chapter 24 is to the children of Israel from chapter 25 to chapter 33 it's a warning to the Gentile nations uh, that God is going to bring judgment upon them. Interestingly enough, in chapter 33, he gives this the same thing, Ezekiel. I want you to be a watchman. A little bit differently in what he gives it, but in the, in the last chapters, what we see is God is, is promising them restoration. And so the messages that are coming from, from uh, uh, Ezekiel in the last chapters of the book of Ezekiel, are about how God is going to restore them, but they still have a responsibility to return back to God. They still have a responsibility to repent. They still have a responsibility to do what they're supposed to do for the, to receive this restoration. And so the, the message is, here, we, we need to take warning. We need to take heed in what's taking place. Now, there are several things I want to share with you this morning. I'm going to do them uh, as quickly as, as, as possible. And should I run out of breath and sit down, you'll understand why. Uh, all right, let's first, first of all, there was the commission. We talked about that. Uh, but I want you to notice something specifically in this commissioning in chapter number 3, verses 12 and four, through 14. As God commissioned the man of God to do the work of God, he filled him with the Spirit of God. That's important to understand. God doesn't just call somebody to to preach a message or to prophesy or to give out a, the word of God without empowering him to do that. In fact, if you look in verse number 12, notice this. He says, Then the Spirit, of, the Spirit took me up, and I heard uh, behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. And I heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and the noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. The important thing to understand is, is that when the preacher stands up, if he's a preacher of the truth of the Word of God, he's going to be preaching in the Spirit of God, or he needs to sit down. There's a few preachers that I know of that, that are, are well known that are on the airways that are you can watch them on TV you can watch them on the internet they have no message they have no spirit they have nothing that, that that's going to change the heart and the life of the individual in fact if you move this to the New Testament book of Acts chapter 1 Jesus they're, they're question hey are you going to come back and set your kingdom up now <laughs> Jesus, oh no 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 you, you missed the whole point he goes up into heaven, and in chapter 1, verse number 8, he says, You shall receive power, 
after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnessed unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In chapter number 2, we, we see a great filling uh, of the New Testament disciples, the men of God, as they stood there they uh, on the uh, in the upper room as they were praying on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, the power of God came down from heaven and lit upon these men, and they began to preach the word of God with boldness, and 3,000 souls were saved. Each one of them heard that, that were saved heard the gospel message in their own language. There were 18 some different languages spoken of there. You see, Peter, who was the main speaker that day, had failed numerous times during, his, during Jesus' ministry here on earth. In fact, he even cursed and said, I don't even know the man. And yet, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came down, he filled him, and Peter's life was changed. Peter's life came about, and as he preached the Word of God with boldness, he was willing to stand uh, in front of the magistrates and the governors and the chief priests and all of those uh, who were in authority and in the control and say, no, we're going to preach the Word of God in, in the name of Jesus Christ, whether you like it or not. He spent some time in jail, but he was willing to do so. See, the difference in somebody standing up there and telling you what you want to hear with a big smile on their face is not helping. And they're not preaching in the spirit and the power of the word of God. This just in. When they quote from several different, uh, uh, what I call perversions of the Bible, they're trying to find something to, to make their words sound right. Why don't you just stick with a proven 400-year Word of God, the King James Bible. 99% pure before they started printing these perversions, before the Revised Standard Version even was printed. They said, oh, we don't need a, 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 to update this. This is pure. So why do, we, why do we have all these perversions now? It's because the problem is, is that we just don't like the way it's said. That's why your kids come to you and say, well, Mom, can I do this? No. So they ask it a different way. They want to reward it. They want to restate it. They want to... Hello? And that's what, what our society is today. And that's why we have all these different perversions, because it, it waters down the truth of the Word of God. What did, what did God tell Ezekiel? Be an ad, your head and be an adamant stone. Be hard-headed. Don't back down. Don't compromise. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't listen. Don't look at their faces is what God told Jeremiah. He said, just preach. That's what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering. Why? Because the time will come. When they'll heap to themselves teachers having itch, itch and ears. That's that new mega church thing that's going around. Hey, you tell me what you want to hear and I'll preach it to you. That's what they did. They went out into the neighborhoods and said, hey, knock on your door. Hey, rather than say, hey, do you, if you were to die today, you know for sure you go to heaven? They go, hey, uh, we, we're from uh, uh, X church down here and and uh, we're trying to uh, just kind of appeal to the people in the neighborhoods and in, in our city and, and sit, find out what it is that you want in the church. <coughs> That is not Bible. That is not what came, comes from the Word of God. God says, preach this, and you preach it. Now, there was that commission. He was filled with the Spirit of God. The message was to give warning. The message, number two, was to give warning. What kind of warning was it to give? Repent or burn. Repent or burn. You say, well, that's harsh. I didn't write it. I'm just reciting it. But look what he says over here. Notice what he says in verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Where does the warning come from? From Jim Lamb, the preacher, the pastor? No, it comes from God. It comes from his word. It's not going to change. It's not going to be watered down. It's not going to be compromised. Why? Because it is the very word of God. And notice what he says. He says in verse 18, And when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, 
nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Preacher, your job is to preach the warning from me as it is given to you. But, God, that just sounds really, really hard. Can't we just say it a little nicer? Can't we just make it a little more palatable? Where they'll ingest it? Look back into chapter number 2, verse number 9. Let's pick up in verse number 8, because this is too good to pass up. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, as it was written, within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. God says, now, Ezekiel, I want you to take the word of God, and I want you to ingest the word of God. I want you to understand the word of God. I want you to understand it in such a way that you can put it out again. You see... We look at the Word of God, and, he, and as he says here, it's full of mourning and lamentations and woe. Well, that's all God is. He, he's just, he just wants to uh, make us weep and cry and mourn and, 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 and just give us the bad news on everything. Well, that's not really what the Word of God is. But notice in, in chapter 3, verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat. Thou that thou findest, that thou findest, eat this roll and speak unto the house of Israel. I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat. And I and he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and to fill thy bowels with the, this roll that I give thee. Then I did eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Wait, time out. Ezekiel said in verse 10 of chapter 2 was written within and without there was written there in lamentations mourning and woe but when he took the book and he ingested the book and he ate the book it was sweet as honey now what's the difference what is the difference there why is it full of of, of mourning and lamentation and woe. And yet, on the other hand, it's sweet as honey. You want the answer? Do you want the answer? For those who are ignoring the Word of God, that's all it is. Mourning and lamentation and woe. Well, that's all that preacher talks about. It's all the bad things I do. All the things. But for the child of God, it's sweetness. Pilgrim's Progress. Christian starts out from from the uh, the city of destruction. He's headed to the celestial city. He's got this burden on his back. He, he opens the word of God and he reads it and he understands where he's, where, where he's headed and where he's going and he cries out to God and says, what shall I do? Then he finds as he continues to read the book, it's not lamentation and mourning and woe, but there's something to be gained. There's something to be receive from the goodness and the mercy of God. What he saw was his, his, his wicked life, and what he saw was his, his, the torment that he was living in. What he, what he saw was that he was, he was destined for a place called hell. And when he received it, and he received the Lord, then it became sweetness. Because now I can read that and go, man, I am so glad that God saved my soul. I'm so glad that when the preacher preached, he didn't wash it down. They, they, he, he didn't just tell me all the good things I do. Jeremiah put it this way. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. I'm sorry, Isaiah put it that way. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. You say, what are those filthy rags? Well, 
in in the in the Bible, leprosy is a, is an example of sin. It, it is a symbol for sin, and leprous people were put outside the city. They weren't allowed to come within the city. The, 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 the food was left outside the gate. The, uh, and as they left the food, they would, leave, uh, they would leave clean rags and they would lay them out there with the food. And then they would go back in the city and, and, uh, and, and the lepers would come and they would get the food and they would get those rags and they would take those filthy rags from their seeping sores in their body where their, their fingers were falling off and their toes were falling off and their noses were falling off and their ears were falling off. And they would wrap and they would bandage them. But the, but, but the oozing pus and the oozing uh, dis, disgusting things uh, of the, uh, from the, the infection of the leprosy was thrown away and new rags were put on. But those new rags became disgusting. And, <laughs> and he says, all of our righteousness is all as filthy rags. All the good things that we can do. And, and, and there's preachers standing in pulpits week after week and, and they're saying, hey, y'all are so good. God wants the best for you. He doesn't want you to be sick. He doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want you to have... I mean, all you got to do is tell God, God, I, I, I renounce this sickness in your name. Folks, that's a lie from the pits of hell. You say, well, God wants me to be sick. <laughs> Sometimes sickness is to help us to come get closer to him. Sometimes sickness is a... Help us to see where we need to go and where we need to be at. I heard one preacher say one time, he said, man, I was going full guns and I was, I, I was preaching the word of God and I was doing everything I ought to do. And he said, and God was blessing me. All of a sudden, bam, he put me on my back for six months. Just like that, six months. I laid in bed. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't move. He said, I, my body was, was weak and, and, and I couldn't do anything. And he said, all I could do was, was think about God and why I was here. And he fi finally, after six months, he realized all of that he was doing, all of those months, all those years, was about him and not about God. When he realized that, God raised him up, put him back in the pulpit, and it changed. You see, sometimes sickness is, is not a bad thing. Sometimes it makes you stronger. Sometimes it helps us. Sometimes it benefits you. And when we start realizing how good God is to us and how, how merciful he is to us, and those things become sweet to us because we're, be, we're beginning to see it from God's point of view. You see, the message is not to be watered down. The message is to be preached the way that God said it to be preached. Throughout the book of Ezekiel, over and over and over again, it's thus saith the Lord. Nowhere in Ezekiel are you going to find thus saith Ezekiel. In fact, in chapter number four, or chapter number three, at the end of the chapter, you're going to find out that once he gave the message, <coughs> he said, now then, I want you to go to your house, I want you to shut yourself inside, and I'm going to cleave your tongue to the roof of your mouth. You say, why would God do that if he wants to give out the message? He didn't want him to speak anything but the word of God. He said, now, when I give you the message, I'll loose your tongue and you can speak. But until then, you're mute. You can't say a word. Man, most of us wouldn't live long, would we? We, we we'd have to do something. We'd be over here with Brother Kurt learning sign language. Fortunately, I'm thankful that I'm fluent in sign language, so that will be a problem for me. Some of you are going over there, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know, because I don't know what he's doing over there. I don't pay attention to him. He confuses me. I look, see him do a sign, I'm going, that's not the way that sign's made. Stop that. Anyway, I digress. The word of God is to be preached the way it's supposed to be preached. And there's a reason for that. It's because there's a warning. The warnings are, hey, for those of you who are, uh, who are wicked, those of you who are unsaved, those of you who are living in sin, it's time to repent. It's time to turn your life around. It's time to make a change. 
for those of you who are righteous. <laughs> and so things come into your life, and, and, and you get bitter with God, you get angry with God, and you start serving, stop serving God, and you start living your own life. There's a message, a warning for you. Hey, come back to me. Come back to me. Why is that? Because God doesn't want anybody to perish. In, in, the, in, in those who are unsaved, just like Christian said, I, it, when I realized that the message was to me, and the message was uh, of sin, and the message of, was destruction, and the message was of hell, then I cried out, what shall I do? Philippian jailer, in Acts chapter number 16, as, as, as Paul is there in that Philippian jail, they're singing, he and, and, and Silas are singing, singing and praising God at midnight. And God opened the, opened the doors and, and they, could have they could have fled. That jailer comes in with his sword and he sees what's happening. He's about to commit Harry Carey. He's about to commit suicide because he knows if they get free, if they, get, they escape, he's going to die anyway. Just won't kill myself that rather than somebody else killing me before a firing squad. Paul said, do thyself no harm. We're all here. I guarantee you, you open the jail house at Harris County, the majority of them are going to be gone. In a hurry. Not looking back. Paul says, don't do thyself no harm. We're all here. The jailer comes in and falls out at their feet and says, what must I do? to be saved. Paul said, well, what you need to do is just do good works. Be the best that you can be. Just follow your own plan. And then the by and by, God's going to accept you. Pope Francis said, well, to the atheist, you don't have to believe in God to get in heaven. It's recorded. I'm not just saying words. You don't, have to, you don't have to believe in God to get in heaven. You can be a Muslim. You can be a Hindu. You can be a Buddhist. You can be Muslim. You can be whatever you want to be. You can live your life, do whatever you want to do. God's going to accept you into heaven. That's not the message of the Bible. John 14, 6, repeat it often. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Jesus had not died, if, if, if there's no resurrection from the dead, Jesus died in vain. There's no reason for him to come. If you can be saved by your good works, your good deeds, your, your, your good abilities, or those things that you do, your morality, then Jesus died in vain. No reason for him to be here. No reason for him to come. But Jesus came and died on that cross that we might be saved. For those who are unsaved, it's the message, hey, you need to get saved. And if you refuse the message of God, <clears throat> you know, the, the interesting thing about that message, people say, well, you know, there's a loving God, and, and, and God's such a loving God, he won't send anybody to hell. That's that message. That's that message. You can live your life any way you want to. Just be yourself. Just be all that you can be. Ezekiel chapter 33, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. soul that sinneth, it shall die. He even says in, in Ezekiel chapter 33, God says, hey, I'm not, it's not my desire that people go to hell, that people die in their sin. And God has done everything that he could to save those who are unsaved. He has. He's given them gospel preachers. He's given them the word of God, gospel tracts, gospel message. I mean, the internet is full of men like me that are preaching the truths of the word of God. By the way, this message is being recorded. It's live streamed <coughs> out across the airwaves, and people in Pakistan are watching this message. People in Iran are watching this message. People in Iraq are watching this message. People in Jerusalem are watching this message. You say, how do you know that? Because we get a report. 
People in China are watching these messages. What are they hearing? They're hearing that God loves them and God wants to save them. God does not want them to go to hell. But the message is you must receive Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. That's not just a physical death because we're all done. That's sometime. There's a cemetery right down here. Every day, almost, I see a procession going out to that cemetery. Because people are dying. And of all ages. Years ago, there was a Valero station, Diamond Shamrock station, actually, on the corner of Garth Road and Cedar by Lynchburg Road. It's a Wells Fargo now. I'd much rather have the Diamond Shamrock. <laughs> Wells Fargo is useless. Well, that's my opinion. I'm sorry. If you have Wells Fargo, I'll power to you. <clears throat> anyway, there was a little girl in there. She's a little uh, Asian girl. I saw her almost every day, two or three times a day I was in there. I gave her a gospel tract and I talked to her. She was Catholic. Just 30, 32 years old. I went in one day and she wasn't there. And I asked, I said, where is she? I called her name. She died. I said, what? No, she, she's, she got pneumonia and the complications and she died. I found out when the funeral was and I went down here to the Crespo funeral home. It wasn't Crespo, it was then. It was uh, Sterling White funeral home went in and I sat down in the back. He said, well, Baptist used to sit down in the front. It was Catholic and I didn't want to get any holy smoke on me. And I sat there while that Catholic priest did all of his mumbo jumbo and all of his smoke and all of his sprinkling of his water all on that casket. And he made this statement. And I'll never forget this statement. He said, there's a place called Purgatory. And in purgatory, you go until all of your sins are absolved. He said, and of course, the Bible teaches us that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is, is one day. So we don't know how long that person will be in purgatory. But their sins will be absolved, and their sin will be refined. And then they go from that place through our prayers, and through the lighting of our candles, and all this into heaven. I wanted to jump up in that service and holler, Liar! I'm true! There's no such place called purgatory. There's a place called hell. And every man, every woman, and every boy that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ and his love and his mercy his grace will go to a place called hell where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Luke chapter 16 gives us a very vivid picture of hell. Rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. See a father Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, Lord, have mercy upon me, for I'm tormented in this flame. Send Lazarus to me, uh, take a drop of water and put it on my tongue, for I'm tormented. Abraham tells the rich man, remember that thou in thy lifetime had good things. Lazarus evil things. Now thou art tormented. He is comforted. You see, the message of hell has been watered down so much. We don't preach on hell. John Osteen started Lakewood Church. I'm not going into all the details of why he started the church, but he started the church. He was a Baptist preacher, pastor, Central Baptist Church here in Baytown. Went out and started the Oasis of Love, Lakewood Church. 
You listen to Joel o or John Osteen preach, and you'd hear a message of hellfire and damnation. God wants to save you. God loves you. God doesn't want you to die and go to hell. John died. Joel Osteen, who was not called to be a preacher, was a behind-the-scenes guy. He did all the videotaping. He was, a, he was the technical guy. But because he had more charisma, they put him out in front. And when he first started, I'd, I'd watch the messages, and he kept it just like his dad. Didn't really preach on hellfire and damnation, but he just kind of kept it. And right towards the end, when it was time for the invitation, he'd pop up on the screen and he'd give a message of Romans chapter three, verse twenty-three, and Romans six twenty-three. Romans 10, 9, and 10, and Romans 10, 13. If you don't know Jesus, you need to know him. To what we have today. And I want to sit here, I want to cry out, Liar! 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 His dad built a church of around 4,000. They boast 80,000 between campus and services and internet. Both Kurt and I went and visited somebody that came to visit our church back a number of years ago, right after we moved on this property. Met the, met the man in the, in the driveway. And we were talking to him. Oh, man, I like the church. Man, it was a good message. Thank you. About that time, his girlfriend walked up. He said, but we won't be back. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. And then she led into me. Well, it was all that message on, on Joel Osteen. You know, he does a lot of good. And people will go to his church and, and, and see that they, they need to get right with God, and then they'll go to another church and get saved. Brother Kurt, stop talk, talking right now. Put your hand. Did he not tell me that? Or she tell me that? that? They will go to his church and see their need and go to another church and get saved. I'm still scratching my head. I'm still wondering, what does she mean by that? If they can't go there and see that they have a need for salvation and get saved there, then why are they there? Folks, I'm not trying to be unkind. What I'm trying to say is there's a warning out there. People that are not right with God need to get right with God. If I don't warn you and you die in your sin and you go to hell, your blood drips from my hand. That's what God told Ezekiel. If you don't warn them, you're responsible. But if you warn them, they're responsible. Joel Osteen and a myriad of others. Joyce Meyer, Ken Copeland, you just follow down the line, have blood on their hands. Because it's all about me. If you remember when Pilate sent us Jesus to be crucified, he took a pail of water and he washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this man. Pilate in hell is still rinsing his hands, trying to convince himself he's innocent of the blood of this man. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7. We talked about it when we were doing through. Notice the word of saying, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. What does it mean for joy? 
If you're unsaved, it will be a joy and a thrill to every one of us here in the service for you to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. But if you choose to walk out these doors without Christ, there's no blood on my hand because I'm warning you. But if you die in your sin and you go to hell, it's on you. But there's another warning. Those of us who are saved, the righteous, If we're living for God and then all of a sudden we decide and we backslide and we get away from God and we start living in sin and I warn you I tell you hey you need to get right with God you need to get your heart right with God and you die in your sin you're not going to go to hell but your blood's up on you because a person that's saved can't go to hell but if I just let you go on you're doing fine. We all stumble. We all fall. Just, just smile and hey, and you die because righteous people can be taken out because of their unwillingness to return, and repent. Not go to hell, but your life can be cut short. If I warn you. It's on you. If I don't warn you, it's on me. And I have an awesome responsibility because every person that darkens the doorsteps of the Garth Road Baptist Church, I'm responsible for. Whether you're a member here or not, I'm responsible for you. I'm responsible for the message. You may not appreciate the message, but I'm responsible for it. I give that message prayerfully in love compassion, and care. My job was being called. God called me to preach December of 1972. For 43 years I've tried to be faithful to that call. I have a pastor this month, 10 years at this church. 20 years as associate pastor of this church before that. I've been in this church for 42 years. Plus. Our responsibility is to you. Where do you stand with God? If you were to die right now, do you know 100% sure for a Bible reason you have a home in heaven? If not, I pray. As we extend the invitation in just a moment, that you'll come. Take me by the hand say, Preacher, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm on the road to hell. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. We'll take the Bible and show you how to be saved. I'm not asking you to be a Baptist. I'm not asking you to join the Baptist church. I'm not asking you to believe my word, but the word of God. And we'll show you from the word of God what the Bible says. If you're here this morning, you say, I'm saved. I'm, I'm going to heaven. I know that. How's your life? How are you living? Are you being faithful to God? Are you following the Word of God? Paul put it this way. Paul put it this way. We are to be conformed to the image of His Son. How are you being conformed to the life of Jesus in your own life? Are you using excuses? Well, I'm Irish. That's why I have a temper. You have a temper because you're a sinner. How, how is your life living with God? May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you for the truth of the Word of God. Lord, you made Ezekiel a watchman. Lord, I believe that in December of 1972 that you called me to be a preacher. That you put a mandate on my heart to preach the truth of the Word of God. You commissioned me to stand true to the truths of the Word of God and to be faithful to preach it just as it's written. I've tried to do that for these past 43 years. Or there may be somebody under the hearing of my voice, whether it's here in this auditorium or whether it's live stream somewhere, that does not know if they died right now. They have a home in heaven. Or 
But I pray. I pray, Father, that they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior Lord of their life today. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for those who are sitting here this morning. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would convict them of their sin, their unrighteousness in their life. Lord, you know what it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what needs to be taken care of. But you do. In this prayer, I ask that the Holy Spirit of God would nestle against each and every person that's here today. For those that need to be saved, that He would encourage them to step forward and come and not to put it off. For those of us who are saved, Lord, that we'd find an altar and do business with you. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Our heads